Muchas gracias. Thank you. It's good to be here with all of you and to share with you some of the work that Shirley uh, Romero Otero, myself, and others are doing down at the southern end of the valley. And I open up with this, these two photos for a reason. Uh, part of the title here is Deep Seeds. And um, you may be wondering, what, what's that? <laughs> Anyone have any idea other than the one or two people I told already? Not quite, almost. It's the intermediate regression toward Teosintle. It only happens in inbred land race parent lines. You won't have it in hybrids or GMOs. I'm going to get to that again, but you were like halfway there. And on the right side is my chimera blend. Every now and then, uh, everything I've got in my seed sanctuary, I'll plant it all together. Uh, I don't do that often, maybe every four or five years. And you can see here. Uh, and some black Aztec. And of course, you have our own uh, maize de concho right there. Oh, it is? Oh, it's not changed. Yeah, and so first uh, I do want to do a land acknowledgement, but I will also say that without solidarity on the ground, it's empty performative allyship. So we work with a lot of Native American communities, and in fact, one of the little known facts about San Luis de la Culebra is that it's one-third Genizaro meaning they're the descendants of the enslaved. I would never call it the descendants of the slaves. That's, that's a settler colonial identity label. They were enslaved, that doesn't make them slaves. One third of our population, primarily Nuchu, which is to say Nuche or Ute, the Diné or Navajo. They after all name most of the sacred mountains around here, right? The Sangre de Cristos to the, the, the Nuche is the shining mountains. They're not the Sangre de Cristos. The Diné, of course, the Navajo named uh, Cisnajini, a very important sacred mountain, my northern horizon every morning that I wake up. The Tiwa, of course, the Taos Pueblo people. And so those are the territories that we are sharing here today. We're also sharing south of us, the Sangre de Cristo land grant at 80,000 acre. Basically, it used to be the entire county of Costilla, but it's now reduced to 80,000 acres. And I'll maybe talk about that again later on. That grant was 1843. I've had a lot of mentors, beginning with my grandma, but it's, she's not showing up on the main screen for some reason. But my grandma was a seat saver. Her name was Margarita Kinner Pena. And uh, she had a habit of saving seeds. <laughs> in little coffee cans next to the, the cupboard, the stovetop cupboard. And I was about 10 years old when I f finally took notice, pardon me, I finally took notice and she explained, I asked her, why are you, what are you doing? Why are you putting those seats in there? And she said something that's really important. Porque la semilla es la memoria de la planta de cómo vivir bien en este lugar. Because the seed is the plant's memory of how to live well in this place. I can remember the phrase. It was like 25 years later that I realized the wisdom, how smart she was. And so indigenous knowledge is a really important part of, of doing the work that we do. There are a lot of indigenous people in San Luis. Another mentor, Adelmo Caber. Mexican adopted by German family. That's very typical of our area, a lot of hybridity and indigeneity mixing together. And when I was asking Adelmo, why uh, do you plant the corn and bean and, uh, together like that? Uh, there's my grandma. Next slide's fine. That's Adelmo. 
Alain Mukaber, my dear late friend, passed away, along with a lot of my other mentors. I asked him, why do you plant the beans with the corn? And, and he says, he was always smoking. Porque Peña le da fuerza a la tierra. That's what he said. And I knew exactly, he wasn't using the term, you know, nitrogen fixing the goom. You gotta learn to respect that. Other ways of knowing, ethnopoetics of knowing biodynamics. Don't always expect the European or American word. That's a mistake. You end up devaluing other people's ways of knowing if you do that. There he is again, my dear mentor, Adelmo Caber. And so what I'm interested in as a farmer and as an intellectual, an organic intellectual, if you want to call me that, in the Gramscian sense, by the way, uh, I'm very interested in challenging, especially with the USDA, what they consider to be scientific knowledge. Because they erase most of the good stuff. And then they impose the problem they created for us was an alfalfa monoculture beef export colony. It's destroying the whole valley. Let's be clear about that. So I'm interested in the indigenous knowledge of how to farm. As if you're being a good ancestor with every single step on that land. You have to be a good ancestor. That's the question you want to ask yourself every day. Ethnoecology. Indigenous knowledge of how ecosystems work, including ethnopedology, the classification of soils, and ethnoedophology, the indigenous knowledge of ecological processes in soil. There's a lot of other tech. And I actually believe this kind of tech is the high spirited tech. That other stuff, it's mundane. That's not real high tech running all these systems. This is high tech. A lot harder to learn and to transmit from one generation to the next. We have an issue in the valley. Uh, I think I bring this up a bit. Yeah. So I live in a little 24 acre biodynamic farm in San Francisco Creek. And the Seca Institute farm is right here by this long lot, but in the bottom lot. These are all acequia flood irrigated fields and up the canyones as well, like Chama Canyon. It's about 23,000 acres, totally irrigated by methods that the state engineer's office once said, oh, those goddamn Mexicans are just playing with water. Mm -hmm. Not realizing all those minerals off the cirques and they're going into the river and they're like filled with nutrients. Flood irrigation puts that back on the land. That's where our soil horizons are six to seven feet deep. We ran out of auger. Where else are you gonna find that in the valley? I dare you to look for it, unless you're doing raised beds, like my colleague. But six foot soil horizon. That's regenerative. We didn't think to call it that, but we've been doing it this way for thousands of years. But we're surrounded by GMOs, GMO alfalfa, GMO, alfalfa, potatoes. Uh, it's another story, but in 2015, we somehow miraculously got the County Planning Commission to vote unanimously on something. Mm -hmm. You know what that's like. Mm -hmm. The ban GMO corn and GMO alfalfa. I'll tell you why. But the American Farm Bureau came to the rescue, threatened a lawsuit, and the county commissioners went out on it. That's the report core of real politics of this valley. There's the heart of our common lands. We're also special not just for the land raised varieties that we grow and the soil regenerative practice that we follow, but this is the largest restored ejido on the planet. 80,000 acres. Sangre de Cristo land grant commons. 50 year battle. That scarred us and cost a lot of the problems we're having now. That's the largest restored common land. Shirley Romero, get up for a moment. She led that struggle. The other thing we're known for around the world, because there's a sequels all over the planet, they actually started in uh, India. 
several thousand years ago, the Kuls, K-U-H-L-S, the Kuls of Kangra. First Asekias, by that we mean a system that's a water democracy. Not like prior appropriation. But keep in mind, we're prior to prior, I like to tell people. We'll come back to that in a moment. Asekia water laws prior to prior, which is a settler colonial law. So, one irrigator, one boat. It's not based on shares, where the big guys just screw over the little guys. You know what I'm talking about, you need to rebel. And in fact, DARCA came and we hosted DARCA, the Ditch and Reservoir Company. We came over to visit us in San Luis, I think it was 2005, do you remember son, when that was? Quite a while ago. They want to be like us, but I said, <laughs> can't do that unless you stop being mutual ditch companies. Because you're going to be share based on prior, you're in trouble to begin with. You can't have democracy. Now, let me warn you, it's messy as hell, democracy. But that's what's good about it, right? That's what's so lovely about it. It's messy. So I'll leave that up there, other than to mention that we're also known for our ecosystem services around the planet. Whether it's the Zancas in the Philippines, the Kuls of Kangra, the Asequias of Yemen, and of um, Morocco and North Africa in general, which is where this system came to Spain during the Islamic Renaissance. Asequia comes from the Arabic word, asakiya. The one who bears the water, who carries the water, has an interesting double entendre as the barmaid. Alcohol. More enlightened times. This is a, a, a bigger view of my chimera. So, the hot fluorescence that I, I keep finding in my milpa, in my polyculture corn bean squash field, the locals call it maiz de trenza like a braid. And I thought, well, wow, what's going on? So I did a little research, and I found out that the Nobel Prize went to George Beadle for the discovery of the ancestry of corn. And I'm gonna get to that in a moment. We need to situate the profundity of all this in global context. Nikolai Vavilov. Who's read Gary Paul Levant's fantastic book, Where Our Food Comes From? Anyone? Oh, you gotta read it. It's about Babilov traveling through Mexico and the American Southwest, including this region. Of course, Mexico, Mesoamerica, is a major center of origin. And what a center of origin is, all your domesticated crops have wild relatives. And so they start it there, right? And usually, as a center of origin diversification will still include the wild relatives, like Tio Sintle, for example. I wish I had time to describe the different centers, maybe some other time. Here's another view of the same, a more accurate rendition of uh, at least the, what I call the corn corridor. This, this is from a Smithsonian uh, publication back in the 1990s. And so there's, it's important to recognize that there are still a lot of areas in North and South America where the wild relatives of domesticated crops coexist in the field. You need to understand that. That's a living biological resource for ad adapting to things like climate change. And it's very important to understand that when you, you go to, to the Svalbard vault, that's only useful to, to Monsanto and Bayer. Like, oh, let's go get seed at the small bar. No, that's as, as Bandana Shiva says, it's a, it's a seed morgue. I agree with her. What's good there is the DNA, that's it. And so you gotta be into biotech to make it real. I believe in in situ and in vivo. Not just, not, let's not get into in situ, ex situ. Should we save the seed in place or take it to the vault, to the seed morgue at CSU? Studies show 60% of that is no longer viable because they're not doing the in vivo part. You gotta keep planning it, especially if you wanna adapt to climate chaos. I'll stop there. That's a whole other topic in itself. This is a very recent, super interesting map because as I was trying to do research to figure out 
Where does that braided corn come from? Where does that maíz de trenza come from? I found the work of Matsuoka. And I think I might have a closer look at the Southwest. You see those turquoise colored little dots? Good choice of color, right? For, for the Southwest. I always thought, smart people. I met Matsuoka. They collected in San Luis, Colorado. We're a part of the Southwestern USA Center of Diversity, Origin and Diversification of Corn. Is it amazing? That's pretty serious. That's why I don't share that corn with you. We don't let it out of the culebra. Although I did notice a, a batch in a bag that said San Luis 80 day. Notice how inferior I mean, ours are like. <laughs> They're giving you bad genetics. Whoever brought that bag or didn't they, or they didn't know how to grow it. Uh, what's happening and why we are a center of origin and diversification is we have these regression mutation events like the appearance of the tunicate. The morphological traits as you see in the photos, no two kernels look alike, no two cobs look alike. And you have four or five major alignments of the cobs, including spirals in our corn, slanted lines, straight rows, cobbled at the bottom, straight rows, cobbled all the way up. Beautiful. You've noticed that I'm sure in some of the photos I've shown you already. And then so there are morphological traits, but there's also adaptive traits. You know, from sea level, say from Seattle to here, that's like an 80% increase in UV radiation. Try to grow Nebraska hybrid here. Uh, if you don't do it right with a cover, it's gonna burn. UV radiation. The plant doesn't have a memory yet of how to live well in this place. I'm gonna borrow that phrase from my grandma. So short season variety. Our corn is 74 to 80 days. Very short stalks. It's a very smart plant. Doesn't waste energy on growing tall. It's smart like me. Compact. <laughs> Eco Chico. Perfect. You know? I put all the energy into my brain rather than the rest of my body. Corn does this same thing. And so my corn also dances. I shouldn't say my corn. Our corn. Instead of laying flat, the leaves turn into spirals. Where's the sun? I think I'll go this way. Plants are sensitive. That's scientific. It's not a crazy spiritual argument. Not that spirituality is that. Don't get me wrong. Ah, there's George Beatles. Although I think he had one of those small penis syndrome instead of a big truck, he's in a green revolution, oversized kernel. Uh, Cobb. I mean, come on, native corn. No, come on, that's a colonizer fantasy. <laughs> right? I mean, and you know, there's a Chacuaco corn that's two feet long in Mexico. It would make his corn look like that. Colonizer in security. Uh, so he exaggerated the green revolution. He worked, you know, with, uh, what's his name? Senior Moon. The, the father green revolution, Norman Borlaug. So that's the green revolution, the native. There's your kind of, And that's Josinkle. That's the grassy ancestor. Zaya diploparinus. Although there's probably eight different varieties now that we know of. There it is. I have been gifted that corn by Corpus Gallegos in 1998, been growing it ever since. And you know, quietly down there in the valley. <laughs> and uh, that one came out in 2010. It wants to go back to being wild. And that just makes my heart happy. The genetics is so fast. Ralph Bertram, let me tell that story. Ralph Bertram Garcia. I taught at CC Colorado College for 15 years before I defected to Seattle, and then now I'm back. But um, Ralph is a corn geneticist. Sorry. Oh, this is being recorded. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. So Ralph, Ralph uh, Bertangracia is a corn geneticist, and he studied this corn in 1998. And he said, you know what? Two things about that corn that, that impressed me. He says, one, it's really inbred. It's a totally inbred parent line, no integration from anything else. 
And secondly, there's a genome part that, that's the same for a map we have of Anasazi corn. So we're talking, I think it's, it's, it's Blandito de Sonora that was brought up here and it got intercrest or chimera uh, cross-pollinated with Anasazi varieties. Very ancient germplasm, 5,000 plus year old. That's why we don't give it away. So other traits, short growing season, the high altitude adaptation, uh, diurnal extremes, a lot of corn dies because it can handle overnight low 38, daytime high of 90. <laughs> we get that a lot around here, right? So your plants have to be smart. They have to learn how to live well in this place, as my grandma used to say. And here we are preparing corn in our uh, adobe ovens. Three generations at Corpus E. Gallegos. I believe that was 19, no, 2005, some time ago. But the thing about preparing corn like this, by the way, is that it makes all the nutrients in corn available, and I'll explain that in a moment. But this is the end product, Chicos del Horno. Who's had Chicos? Oh, good. Some of you have enjoyed the, the wonders of Chicos corn. Adobe oven, oven roasted corn. Uh, Relisted in the Ark of Taste, no, Slow Food USA, as a disappearing and endangered um, food and foodway. They're hard to make. It's, well, that's why I say local, slow, and deep. Deep on a Sazi heritage, it takes weeks to prepare it, and, uh, and of course it's local and place-based. It's not just about the seed. Our project, as you see in our panel this afternoon with my dear friend and colleague Shirley, uh, you have to build institutions of relationships, institutions of collective action. And, a lot, and if you've got the cultural memory, you can do a lot of interesting things with institutions of collective action. Of course, the annual spring ditch cleaning is one of those institutions. There's Rose Mendoza, some of the youth from uh, the Move Mountains project. There's Tanya. That's Tanya, who uh, we plan to support, uh, I call it meso credit, not micro credit, but we're establishing a revolving loan fund, we're gonna talk about that in a minute, to offer zero interest loans. Mutual aid society, like the old one we used to have, SPMDTU. She's a diesel mechanic, and we're gonna help her start a business because we have a need for a, a good diesel mechanic in our village. Oh, we've fought a lot of battles in San Luis because without water, there's no life. Without protecting our watersheds. And it's not just sediment choking the, you know, creating braided stream conditions or just destroying wild wetlands. It's also that it changes the stream hydrograph slope. It alters the rate at which snowpack turns to in-stream flow. We don't have storage rights. We're screwed. We're losing a lot of water. And so we fought it. At, uh, I got arrested with Colorado College students during these protests, which I ended up in Seattle for that reason. They grounded me. Can't go teach in the Valley anymore. So I went to Seattle for a while. We have to make choices though. It's not just about seats and institutions of, 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 uh, of collective action. The way we're farming in the Valley with 5,000 of these horrible circles. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna retract that just to acknowledge a dear friend of mine, Lillian McCracken. I don't know how you all, you know, Green Earth Organics, they had a circle, but it was surface rights in a, in a, put in a reservoir to get the hydraulic power and they did amazing things, a polyculture. I'm not about the corporate guys, the big potato GMO growers, potato, alfalfa, barley, canola, all of it GMO which means all of it herbicides. Why am I down on Roundup and all the glyphosate and everything else? It destroys the mycorrhizal bacterial colonies in the rhizosphere. And I'll get to that in a moment because that actually has the same effect on the human gut microbiome. Exactly the same process of chelation. It's a greedy molecule. <laughs> Mm. 
There's our lovely, look at that morphological diversity. No two cobs are alike. This is important. Zemes clebenus culebrana. So, how we eat. Good old Gary Paul Navan's been one of the most important voices on this in his book, A Food Gene and Cultures. And um, we, are not, we are not just what we eat, we are what our ancestors ate, right? Epigenetic shifts are influenced by diet, toxicants, those are the top two. If you know anything about the study of epigenetic change. Um, so we need to heal. In many cases, the soil has been damaged in the same way that our gut microbiome has been damaged. I teach a course in agroecology in the summer called Dirt to Gut, where we look at all the scientific data on this. Very important question. But how do you prepare the food? Now, this was the mistake that European settler colonists made when they took corn back to Europe. They didn't do this. It's empty calories. No wonder they got pellagra. Of course. You're not cooking it right. You have to use cal, calcium hydroxide. We like to mix it with juniper ash to give it a particular local place-based flavor. But it, what you, when you cook it in this alkaline solution, the corn turns to hominy, basically, right? And then the next step is to run it through, in our case, a volcanic rock cornmeal to turn it into masarina for tortillas, huaraches, tostada, lo que sea. A lot of different things. Well, what nixtamalization does, and I've got 11 and 12, right, Shirley? We have 14-year-old kids in San Luis using this word and talking about, Professor, I saw the mycorrhizal bacteria. <laughs> Can happen. So it makes all the nutrients available, the, the, the B vitamin series, the niacin, the amino acids to build protein, and uh, some of the other anti-inflammatory phytochemicals. If you don't do that, you're getting empty calories. It's dangerous. Here's the process that we're following. This is also connected to another crisis. When I look at monocultures in circles, I see this. You know, we went from, I, by the way, I grew 10 pound cabbage last year the one from AFI, Affiliated Foods, that goes to our market, this size. And they're sad, and they don't last in the fresh produce cooler. <laughs> Awful. We had 544, around 1903, we're down to 28 varieties. Corn, sweet corn, from 307 to 12. We're in trouble, so the more, the more you narrow the phytochemical diversity of your your food crops, the more you're going to contribute in cumulative effects to the, the bankruptcy of the, bios, of the human gut microbiome. It's a complex process and this is what I teach during the summer. I'm especially interested in studies that evaluate how this can contribute, that diverse crop diversity can contribute to various kinds of metabolic and inflammatory conditions like diabetes and uh, others like uh, sensitivity to gluten and so on. We're going to start growing white Sonoran wheat, which is not like the dominant wheat, by the way. It's, it's healthy wheat. So it plays a key role. I'm sure you've heard this already, so I won't repeat it, but uh, a healthy gut microbiome is really helped by uh, having a healthy uh, diet and having food that reflects the nutrient density of what's possible rather than that which is impoverished by modern monoculture techniques. Which brings me, of course, to the question of the quality of the cultivars that we eat. Crop genetic diversity is a very significant aspect because it's how we implement our dietary patterns and it's based on specific genetic traits that we selected over generations. And if you all of a sudden rob people of that heritage, you're creating epigenetic changes that make people vulnerable and more susceptible. So we need to pay attention not just to what our ancestors ate, but to the properties of the food that we're eating. You're not eating your grandmother's carrot anymore because of what we've done to the soil. That's dirt to gut health. So this final part of my presentation brings me to our farm. There's uh, the heart of our common lands. Uh, Joe Gallegos, the late 
Joe Gallegos, another mentor of mine, right there in the front in the red hoodie. Uh, we lost Joe in 2016 while I was at the, the Convention on Biological Diversity in, in Cancun. He passed away. He was one of my mentors. That sprinkler is my neighbor. And he hated me because there used to be a center pivot sprinkler on our farm. Took it out immediately. And when I started flood irrigating, all the tusas, all the ground squirrels, or prairie dogs, they moved to his place. <laughs> Always polyculture, always, always polyculture. More than one crop, more than one allele of corn, for example, as well. We also work a lot in restoring heritage crops. I think I've got one here, the bolita, beans. I'll pass that around. And it's very different from the Duff Creek adobe mills, which is large and square. So as a farmer, you get more acreage, more yield. The culinary property, mm -mm. It's like pinto beans, you know, watery. People always ask that little round ball, it has so much starch that it, did you add whipped cream or what? No, that's, that's, the, way it, that's the way genuine heirloom bolitas cook. It matters. So let me know when I run out of time. I'm almost out of time, I'm sure. So diversity in our approach to things is the key to resilience, obviously. Oh, beautiful, that's an intercrop with babas and, um, and beans crawling up the corn plants. I also like Rudolf Steiner. And you can't really blame him for not mentioning indigenous knowledge because it was suppressed. No one knew about it except for indigenous people. But that just echoes with my grandma's wisdom. It's his successors that piss me off. So obviously from, from Rudolf Steiner, we learned that soil's a living thing. Here's my favorite part of the rhizosphere, the mycorrhizal bacterial colonies that allow plants to take up nutrients from the soil. They're chelators, cash and ex exchangers. The healthier your soil, the more nutrients end up in the biomass of your crop. It's that simple. So here's some basic principles of what I call indigenous biodynamics. Soil's alive, treat it like that. <laughs> Don't treat it like trash. Don't keep overdosing it on fertilizer, even organic. Use complexity, use diversity, respect diversity. Companion plants do more for soil health than any kind of organic fertilizer. It just takes time. You have to be patient. You also have to rest the land for it to get to where it can regenerate. You can add compost, manure, a little pathic, I don't use the ram's horn. I think that's a little bit over the top for me. But a good compost, some good red wigglers does the trick. You don't need a ram's horn. Um, healthy soil is nutritious crops and be gentle, don't get greedy. Rest the land, do the work. Um, by the way, don't fall for the minimum tillage it has to be the key to regenerative ag. Well, first of all, most of it relies on herbicides. 98% of it. There's a small minority of farmers who do a minimum tillage with machinery and companion crops, and that's the key to, to a good a practice of minimum tillage. But some soils actually like to be disturbed. We have this ideology of fragility of the environment. That's what I always hated about her first. The virgin forest, that's a male fantasy. Mm -hmm. Stop it. Same thing with the soil. <laughs> so. I'm about decolonizing everything, as, as <laughs> Ward has said in, in that interview I did on Think Radio. Um, it means we have to resist biopiracy. We have to resist having some life. And we can't allow for the expropriation by outsiders of our, our, our ancestral crop varieties. Of course, we have to abide by regenerative biodynamic practices, and we also need to connect it to the gut. 
and spirit. We can recover our heritage crops and community. That's the zoom red, you see the rainbow? Just the right moment. But you know, if you look at that plant, uh, I should have had, it, it's got the twirly leaves and it's got, it's sitting four feet tall. I'm so sorry. And that's it, uh, a sick institute. That's the restoration We A lot of people ask me, what do you grow, Pena? And I only have jokingly say I grow ecosystems. That's our primary response. So we have a conservation easement with Colorado Open Lands. Uh, about 80% of the 181 acres is wildlife habitat and managed as such. And so on the river, which used to be all barrancos paving in from cattle over the winter, cattle in the spring, cattle always, uh, we kicked out. They're still in the north fields, We're not anti-cattle, but we don't want them in the riparian zone ever. And so it's come back. And not just the, the cottonwoods were dying, and now we, have, we stopped counting at 800 juveniles. But what's coming back to is Osha, you know, the Capulin, uh, the wild currant, uh, the, 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 what is it, the five point sumac, I'm forgetting the name. Uh, they're all back. There's cows around. So all of the biotic. Thank you for being here. Was it that bad? <laughs> Pardon me? <laughs> yes. Decades. It's not, it's not an easy, that's why it doesn't happen that often. Because of the economics, it's, it's, it's very hard economically. The larger you get, say you have an acre, you know, my biodynamic experiments on my home kitchen garden took 20 years. I got a six foot horizon where it used to be Pleistocene gravel, took 20 years. But that's a little 150th of an acre where I started practicing biodynamics. Now I'm looking at 181 acres, about 50 is in a rotation fallow of, of organic alfalfa hay. So I'll produce row crops for three or five acres and then use that area for four or five years and then go on to the next part and reseed that with alfalfa. And that's a good practice, it helps. So if you're lucky and you have water rights and see there's always a catch. And, and you have access to good organic alfalfa that has pretty deep roots, so it can create structure. That, you know, people, did, including me, I diss alfalfa, but it's only because we have a damn monoculture of it. Not that I'm against alfalfa, it, has a, it plays an important role on our land, you know, because we rotate through those 50 acres, about three to five acres, so the land has time. It's about a 20 to 30 year cycle. I've only done it once, because I've been there 20 plus years. And uh, I'll not get to see the second one probably, but someone else will. And I think, again, being a good ancestor means I want to leave that soil healthier than it was when I got it. And I think we're getting there. But it, it takes it's slow work. Now, there are all kinds of shortcuts. And the gentleman that just left, he was talking about some of those shortcuts earlier today. Raised bed agriculture can be a really nifty way of concentrating biodynamic processes. But I'm dealing with acres. You can't build a one acre box. It's just, you know, you can't. So that's why I'm saying, if you're gonna go larger scale, it's gonna take 20 years maybe. There are other things you can do. The, the companion planting, terracing is really good for increasing biodynamic, uh, uh, acce the acceleration of biodynamic buildup of soil. That's a good practice. Um, Chickens, all that, anything that'll poop on that land that's not going to graze it, but is looking for insects, excellent to accelerate the biodynamic buildup of the soil. There are, there are a lot of other practices, but I think the key for indigenous people is polyculture, polyculture, polyculture. Lots of companion plants. Uh, I have another presentation. I studied all the codices, the Aztec uh, manuscripts. 
One is the, uh, the, the La Cruz Badiano of 1552. And uh, the La Cruz Badiano has 185 pictures of like almost 200 different medicinal plants. Me always being curious, said, okay, they're medicine, plant medicine for the body. What about plant medicine for the soil? So I started looking on the biodynamic tincture list of the biodynamic association. Sure enough, almost every single one is also uh, medicine for the soil. So that led me to conclude that the best way to approach this if you're patient and you have the resources to be patient, and many of us don't have a choice. Either we're lacking water rights or we're, we're having development pressures or too many costs. I think we need a rebellion where we revive mutual aid traditions and start doing a revolving loan fund for biodynamic restitution of the land. It's got a colonial wound, just like people of color. And all of us, actually. Everyone's got a colonial wound. And so healing that help each other with, with zero interest loans like what we're doing, but I'm getting ahead to the panel that we're doing in a moment. Well, again, if you look at, at indigenous practices in Mesoamerica, there was always fiber being grown, always. The agave. Agave, you can use it for like a hundred different things to make a hairbrush, shampoo, soap. It's a good uh, uh, purifier of water. You can make tequila, <laughs> tequila. Um, uh, and, and yes, so you, the mucilage can be used for replenishing soils. And of course, maguey is known for being used in basketry and other kind of fiber work. So the maguey, the century plant, comes to mind, but it's one of many different examples. And I know Jesus here could tell you about other examples of all the traditional fiber plants that grow in a Mexican milpa or in a Central or a Mesoamerican milpa. There's a long list. Um, one of them is, uh, it's a plum, what do they call it, blood, uh, blood worm? And when you, it's, it's a fruit shrub that you actually have to wait like the coffee that gets cooked out by those cats in Indonesia. There, this too has to be eaten by wild animals before it intensifies the antioxidants to produce a very tasty uh, blue je uh, red jelly. That's just good medicine. So yeah, that was in the uh, De La Cruz Badiano. I learned about them in the De La Cruz Badiano. So there are a lot of, it's called, uh, the English version's called the the little as the Aztec the little Aztec book of herbs of medicinal herbs, a kind of condescending name, but you know, hardly <laughs> little. So yeah, no fiber is good, but what's if we're thinking hemp, then it becomes a more complicated story. Not for everyone, but certainly for acequia systems, where you know you have a certain tradition of repartimiento de agua. And I get to use the water for five days every month and a half. You know, so my crops have to be, hemp won't do that. But if I got a guy above me hogging water because they need to irrigate the hemp all the time, on a sequia commons irrigation systems, that just doesn't work. Which is why all the hemp or, or CBD or THC that's grown in San Luis is in greenhouses with drip irrigation. And in fact, we're having to do the same thing in the sense that uh, in drought years, because our water is the oldest water rights in Colorado, all snowpack, spring melt. Uh, in times of drought, we also use gated pipe and drip irrigation. But we don't want to abandon flood irrigation because it, it's regenerative. It brings all those minerals from the mountains down to the soil. So in good years, you want to switch back to flood irrigation. 
If you're on a mutual ditch company or something like that and everyone's saying, oh, you gotta drip irrigate, yes. Times of drought, shortfalls, of course. But when you can get back to flooding, it'll help you renew the soil. See, and I feel confident because Jesus is nodding his head and he's the real expert around here. Gracias, compañero. Yes.